If you can hear this message, listen closely. To the exiled, misunderstood, or upside down, this is your message of hope. When problems come, use them. When enemies persecute you, love them. These struggles are a fire, refining you into gold. Look around. You are not forgotten. You are not alone. Challenge what is expected of you. This world is not your home. You are different. Good morning, believers. I'm excited this morning because I am coming to you from the sanctuary. We're back out of the basement and we're getting everything together, ready to come back home July the 5th. Cannot wait to see you. Independence Day weekend where we celebrate our freedom in the nation. But even better than that, we're going to come back together and celebrate our freedom in Christ. Even though I'm recording on a day before Sunday, I got to see some of you last night on Saturday. Remember, Saturday's at 515. We're here on campus praying, spending time together, building community, hanging out afterwards, fellowshipping a lot, and then just praying because I believe prayer <clears throat> is a great necessity. It's the power of God, but it's a necessity in this time. So thank you so much for being part of that. All of our groups have launched. I'm hearing great things about people getting back together in the community. So we're, we're coming back home. Cannot wait to see you July 5th, 9, 15 and 11, 15. Well, it has been a crazy six months from a fire that caused a flood that caused major insurance problems a lot of frustrations that ensued, uh, you know, from myself and Robin being displaced out of the basement and then uh, Ryan having to put up with me for several months sharing an office with him and we got really close. And then the coronavirus comes that shuts down churches and all of my favorite Mexican restaurants and it has just been a crazy, crazy time, uh, you know, and on my prayer walks and at home talking with my family and even just making jokes about it. It's just been so different, uh, but I've grown a lot and I hope you've grown a lot through it. As I've always said, you know, in our uh, greatest crisis, uh, it reveals our weakest link. So, you know, I saw some habits of mine through this and I thought, man, I need to fix some of that. I need to change some of these things. I've been praying for you too, that God would do the same for you, that he would just reveal the weak areas in your life because that's what crises is due. They reveal our weakest link, but as I said a few weeks ago, a crisis also reveals the wisdom of God. And man, we are in the middle of a great crisis in our nation right now. Many of you may have seen the video that was shared of the tragic killing of George Floyd, uh, <clears throat> the derelict of duty of the police officers that uh, ended his life. And uh, man, it just brought me such sorrow to why I watched the video. My daughter had shared it with me. And you know, I was just tragic. I hurt my heart and I watched the whole thing. I'm even talking back to the video like, come on, get off the guy's neck. This is so wrong and, and evil and hurtful. And then, you know, I wake up the next several days and, and then off it goes. Humanity at our worst, uh, you know, just murders and rioting and looting and more people being shot and buildings being burnt down and, and just the craziness. And it makes me just wake up and, and as I watch humanity, as I said several days ago, you know, without God, without Jesus Christ changing our hearts, humans at our base level are just like animals. So we follow our mere instincts, Jude chapter one. Uh, you know, we just follow base instincts. We get caught up in emotions. We do hurtful, angry, bitter things. And, you know, even though when I watch it, I get so discouraged, like, you know, personally, I'm mean, just being honest with you, I get so discouraged at uh, the depravity of humans. You would think that just morality alone could solve it. Like, let's just be moral people and stop doing such wrongful things and hurtful things against other humans. But obviously, we all know morality doesn't fix it uh, because at the base of who we are without Jesus, there's none good. Uh, Romans will say it this way, not even one person. And that's hurtful too, that God looks down upon us 
and we think, man, is, is he discouraged? I mean, I, I wonder if God's up there looking at all of us humans just, you know, discouraged, but I don't think so. I think God looks down and says, I've made a remedy. And that's just what I want to talk to you about this morning. I hope it gender, genders a conversation with you uh, in your groups, with your children, husband and wife, or maybe I hope it genders a conversation with people of other races that uh, may have different opinions in you or coming from a different perspective that it will open a conversation that you can talk and you can gain understanding but I want to do what <clears throat> I feel my calling is. You know, I've said this before, I'm not a politician, uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, I'm not in the police field. I served a little bit, you know, in public service for a little stint of my life uh, in the fire department. But, you know, my calling is to the kingdom of God. That, that's what God has asked me to do. So I don't know what the Lord is calling you to action to do. But whatever it is, I want you to get involved to make a difference. I want you to be able to look at what's going on and be able to be bold enough to go, man, that's wrong, that's evil, call it for what it is. But if we're not careful as Christians, we miss uh, really what we're called to do. And, and being called to do something <clears throat> in a godly way. So that's just what I want to talk to you about. I want to take what I'm called to do and hopefully it'll inspire you. Uh, maybe you feel called to be in the police force or the sheriff department or to be a lawyer or even to run for politics so you can uh, try to make a difference in our world. But I do want to share this with you from my perspective. Do we really think more laws will fix it, more politicians? Let's get Trump out of office. Let's put Joe Biden in. Let's get Joe Biden out. Let's put Pence in, whatever. I mean... Uh, do we really think more laws are going to fix the problem? Do we really think another politician is going to fix it? God gave us tw uh, 10 laws. We couldn't even do those. So uh, that's the way I want to look at it this morning. And, and I want you to tune in because I'm going to do it a little different. I'm going to take you on a journey through Scripture because I want to uh, encourage you how to respond as a Christian when we're living in a culture that seemingly so depraved uh, and so backwards. And, you know, maybe you, like me, looked at this video, if you've seen it, and just talked back to it, like, come on, really? This is what we've turned into? The animal instincts, the hate, the, the racist mentalities, the anger, the bitterness, and now the looting and the rioting. And, and, you know, you may feel like, God, what can I do? And you can do a lot. I mean, that's the lie, is to feel like you can't do anything but you can, there's a lot you can do. So I wanna take it from a kingdom what you can do. So what you do on your personal level is great. I encourage you to get out and do it, but I, I wanna encourage you, how do you move forward from a kingdom mentality to where you can make a difference? Because the worst thing you can do as a Christian is to shut up and be quiet and not make a kingdom difference. Uh, you know, and just, uh, even though I've said this before, but it bears on my heart always that let's just pray. And, you know, I hear some people say, man, that's just a cop out just to pray. But prayer is not a cop out. Prayer is an essential thing that we can start with. And so we can start with prayer. But beyond that, what other actions can we take as Christians, whether we're getting involved in politics, police force, law, uh, you know, schools, wherever we are, sporting events, whatever you're called to do in your calling, a teacher, uh, a nurse, a doctor, uh, an entrepreneur, whatever you're called to do, leading a business, uh, being a homemaker, uh, you have to do this in such a way that you represent the kingdom. So I want you to get your Bible out. I've got communion. We're going to take communion at the end. We're going to really take communion in light of what God has asked us to do as Christians. And then I want it to gender some conversations uh, with your kids, with your you know, husbands and wives, and <clears throat> with friends especially. Uh, even getting together with people of other races and going, let's talk this through. How can we make a kingdom difference in a world that's seemingly so fragmented and fractured and backwards and hurtful, demented, delusional, angry, bitter, racist, uh, you know, because the saddest thing for you to do is to stand back and go, man, there's nothing I can do. That's a lie from the pit of hell. There's stuff we can do as Christians. We're called to do it. And so let's just start here. 
uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you will turn there with me. I'm going to read out of a different version uh, since I've been in quarantine. I've been pulling out all my old Bibles, and uh, I'm, I'm probably embarrassed to tell you how many that is, but I just have a lot of Bibles I've collected over the years, and so I'd pulling out different versions, you know, through this, just reading them because I like the challenge of reading a different take on it from a different translation. So I'm in the Christian Standard Bible today, and I like it. I've enjoyed it. And so I'm reading from that, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So I really get your phone out, um, your, your Bible, because I really want you to see it with your eyes, not just listen to me read it, but I want you to put your eyes on it because I'm going to take you through methodically of some scriptures that will help you know how to move forward and talk to people and act in such a generation that we're seeing in this divisive time that we're in. So get that out and jump in. I'm going to ask when they edit this as well that they'll edit the points across the bottom of the screen. So if you're a note taker, you can like point one and then you can discuss those later. Like, are we following this plan? Because what I, uh, you know, talked to Ryan about and Matt and everybody that was here helping record, uh, you know, I really asked God to give me something meaningful, not just a sermon, but something meaningful that'll help you move forward in a kingdom way. So here we go. Second Corinthians chapter five is where we're going to start almost to the very end. Verse 16. Let's listen to it. I'll read it. You put your eyes on it as well and follow along with me <clears throat> from now on. Then we do not know anyone in a purely human way. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about that there is a kingdom purpose on, on every human that's alive. Like everybody has value. I can't just look at a race versus a race because God made us the way he made us. He gave us the color that we, we have on our pigmented skin. He gave us the, the families that we grow up in. And Paul says this, he said, look, let's just stop knowing people from a purely human way. And now he's about to open up a wonderful way of thinking about humanity. And here it comes. Even if we have known Christ in a purely human way, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So here's, here's the steps I want to take you through to be an actionable person that, that is a believer in your community. Uh, you know, I'm not asking you to get on, on a bus or a car ride or a plane trip to Minneapolis and put yourself in the middle of a, a social justice war. I'm just simply asking you to own your 50 feet because it's easy to uh, get caught in a trap emotionally of looking at something that's so vile and evil and then sharing it, hashtagging it, tweeting it, putting a picture out, and then going, well, I did my duty. You know, uh, I did my social justice war, and now I can kind of check that box that I did my part, and I can move on with my life. You can't think that way as a Christian, because if you're not careful, you really make no difference at all, and you trick yourself into thinking you are making a difference because you shared a picture, you shared a video, you shared a hashtag, you bought a t-shirt, uh, you know. I'm not saying that's wrong by any means. I mean, you know, to keep the narrative going and the help going and the change going. But if you don't understand that the way you make a difference is to start with you inside your 50 feet. So that's kind of how I want to look at this this morning is that, you know, as tragic as Minneapolis was with the death and murder of George Floyd, and as vile as that was to watch, and now as tragic and hurtful it is to watch people burn down their city and destroy businesses and loot and act the fool, uh, 
Let's bring it personal to us and say, okay, we know that's going on. Let's don't ignore it. Uh, but neither do let's use it for some prideful thing to check the box off and go, well, I admitted it and I admitted it, it was wrong and I admitted it was a problem. Therefore, it's off my back because now I've entered the fight by admitting it. So I'm not even asking you to admit it and then just check the box and move on with your life. I'm asking you to see what happened I'm asking you to acknowledge that we live in a generation that is desperately in need of something more than laws and new politicians and Democrats and Republicans. We're in need of something that the Bible is going to say is reconciliation. Um, it's, it's a message and a calling. And so I want to look at you first. And so I'm going to just, you know, look at us internally and ask some hard questions and then I'm going to take the internal us and push us out to action of what can we practically do uh, in our generation. So let's just start here. First, here's the first thing. You have to see yourself as an ambassador for Jesus. If you just sit there and go, God, we live in such a crazy, fallen, stupid world. Oh my God, OMG, I can't believe that police officer did that. I can't believe they're rioting. I can't believe they're looting. Okay, great, believe it. It's happening whether you ignore it or not or see it or not, believe it. And it's not a shock, so don't act like you're shocked. This has been going on since Genesis chapter 4 when Cain killed Abel. So uh, let's don't pretend like that violence and craziness and sin and hate and racism doesn't even exist. Of course it exists because we're fallen people. Um, you know, this is why this scripture says you have to be made a new creation because nothing about the old creation is ever going to work. Uh, what, we can pamper it, we can you know, put new clothes on it. What does the scripture say? You can lead a pig to, you know, bathe it up, but it's still a pig. You know, you can clean it, but it's still a pig. So let's, let's just start here. You are an ambassador. And if you're not going to see yourself that way, you're part of the problem. If you're just going to see yourself as a social justice warrior, you're not really doing kingdom work. You're not called to be a social justice warrior. You're called to be an ambassador. And there's a big difference. A social justice warrior is all about the crimes that are being done. I'm going to make a difference. By God, I don't care. And, and you really represent more your emotions and your anger and your frustration and your concerns rather than you know backing off of that and going okay I still can get involved I still can make a difference but rather than getting in as a social justice warrior I need to get in as an ambassador of Jesus Christ and I love what it said it said as if God now check this this is this is man deep to me it's deep as if God is appealing to the world through me be reconciled. In other words, we say, man, why didn't God do something? And I go, he did do something. He sent Jesus. Well, why didn't Jesus do something? He did. He gave you his spirit, and now he says, you go be an ambassador. So if you're going to watch a video and, oh, my God, and then hashtag George Floyd, and then hashtag how terrible our world is, and then share pictures, but yet you've checked the box that you've done your social justice duty for the day or the week, you've missed the purpose of the kingdom. The purpose of the kingdom is not for you to share a tweet and hashtag something so you feel good about yourself, you are to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You are to tout his message, be reconciled to God. So when you're watching all of the hell and all of the vile and all of the evil and all of the ignorance and all of the pain and the hurt, and the stuff that's done wrong from one human to another, whether white to black, black to white, Hispanic to white, Hispanic, whatever. If, if we look at this and go, man, I've got to get involved as an ambassador to say to people, be reconciled to God. So that's my first thing. Do you do that? Just be honest, yes or no. Do you own your 50 feet as an ambassador? Are you out there? I'm going to read it one more time. I don't know what other versions say, but I like what it says. Therefore, we are ambassadors, verse 20, for Christ, certain that God is appealing through me. God makes an appeal through me to say, be reconciled, man. 
Come to Jesus. Know His peace. So let's start there. First things first, you have to be an ambassador of God and you have to say He wants to use me. So start there and, and say, I think God wants to use me at work. He wants to use me in my home. He wants to use me on the ball field, my cheerleading squad, my gym squad, my football, my baseball team, my track team, wherever it is. Uh, God wants to use you in your business. He wants to use you as an ambassador. That's step one. You've got to know, do you see yourself as an ambassador or a social justice warrior? They both can be running toward the same thing, but the strange part is one is motivated by a very emotional, me-centered agenda, and the other is motivated by, man, I represent something bigger than myself, bigger than my emotions. I represent a problem that's even bigger than me, that there is a world out there that's governed by a demonic father called the devil, and I'm part of a new kingdom, and I need to let people know there's hope. Next scripture is Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> I want you to listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1. Because uh, this is the second thing that uh, I've tried to do. I don't know if I'm always good at it. but I definitely try, uh, you know, to, to be the best Christian I can be. I mean, even when I get irritated. You know, I got irritated. Robin and I were talking about something the other day and I got irritated and I, I said something that I just had to finally say, you know, to her, I texted back and said, look, I'm sorry, that was rude. I should have never said that. Please forgive me. So, I mean, even in my following Jesus, there's still times that my emotions and my flesh can get involved and I, and I have to bring myself back. So let's just answer as we get ready to go to the second thing in Philippians chapter 1. Am I a social justice warrior or am I an ambassador of Jesus? And then the second thing is this, as you watch the evil that plays out in our world, whether through racism, terrorism, anger, hurt, whatever, uh, you know, just injustices that are done, um, it's, it's easy to feel like we're losing. You know, like, do we Christians even make any difference on our planet? Because you think if there's so many people that confess to be Christian, that we should be making a dent in our world. Like, I want to ask the question, where are all the Christians in Minneapolis? Why aren't they on the street going, man, there's hope, there's life, there's love. There, I don't know, I'm not watching to see. But it makes me, you know, ask the question, do we see things like this? And here's, here's my second one. Do you see uh, the pain, the hurt, the anger, the injustice as an opportunity for the gospel to move forward? All right, so that's the first is, do you see yourself as a social justice warrior or an ambassador of Jesus? The second one, do you see the injustices that are happening, the evil, as an opportunity for the gospel to move forward or as an opportunity for you to just share your emotional opinion? And man, that's big too. Because if we're not careful, we get caught up in the middle of something and we just kind of leave truth aside. And man, I go to me, man. My thoughts, my emotions, my feelings, my race, my hurt, my this, my that. And we all have that, right? I mean, it's all, we don't. We all have the me-centered thing that wants to protect me and defend me. And uh, I mean, that's a, a normal thing for humans. But in everything that happens that concerns us as humans, on a personal level, on a racial level, on a cultural level, a family level, everything that happens in an injustice, evil, wrongful way, I can either see it as an opportunity to be a hurtful, hateful, revengeful, rejecting, retaliating person, or I can see it as an opportunity for the gospel to win. Listen to this in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. This is Paul who has been arrested from a jail cell, listen to what he says. Verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advancement of the gospel. You see the power of that? Uh, and, and man, that's hard because this, this just, this stabs selfishness right in the heart. Uh, I'll go way back. I mean, I don't want to downplay something here, but it's personal to me. 
when my wife was killed by a drunk driver. I mean, the anger, every time I saw somebody drinking a beer, somebody driving drunk, I, I had that mentality, they ought to get it. They ought to go to jail. They ought to suffer. Uh, you know, I mean, I had that because I was so hurt and disillusioned by what happened. But rather than seeing what happened as an opportunity to present the gospel, I was taking it as an opportunity to be bitter at everybody that ever drank a beer. Uh, you know, so, so I took what happened to me and in a very personal way, I made it about something other than the gospel. I made it about me, my hurt, my pain, my retaliation, my lawsuit, my, my, my. And I had to learn how to grow up and say, with every hurtful thing that happens to me in my life, that goes against my happiness, my joy, my contentment, every injustice I see, before I let the mark uh, jump in the game emotionally and make it about me, my hurt, and my sorrow, my anger, I have to look at this scripture and go, wait a minute, everything that's happening around me to me is an opportunity for me to advance the gospel. So all this th stuff that we're seeing on TV, uh, the wrongful death of George Floyd, uh, the, the murder of the Aubrey guy in Brunswick, Georgia, the looting, the rioting, the anger, the hate, the vile, the that uh, our mainstream media tends to show us every day. If you're not careful, you're going to look at that and you're going to get sucked into the emotion of it and forget this isn't about you. It's about an opportunity for the gospel to advance. So as you're watching the hurt and you're, you're getting involved and you're seeing it and you're hurting yourself and you're angry yourself, you have to just be honest and go, wait, as an ambassador... I have to seize on this moment to be an opportunity to share the gospel, not just an opportunity to share my opinion, an opportunity to drop a bunch of elf bombs on social media to prove how mad I am and to get my opinion out there for the world to see of how I really feel. We all know how you feel, uh, you know, and, and it's okay to tell people how you feel. But at the end of it all, you need to know, did you just hinder an opportunity from the gospel because of your emotional rant? Or did you really seize the moment to let your emotions and your hurt and frustration be an opportunity to push the gospel forward? Think about this of what Paul said. So that's my second um, encouragement to you, is do you see the hurtful injustices as an opportunity for you to have an emotional rant? or as an opportunity for you to seize the spreading of the gospel of Jesus that we all need hope. 1 Peter chapter 1 now. I want to share this with you. I talked about this a little bit in a video on our Bible reading project. Of course, you can go to our website and check it out. The actual title is called This Means War. And uh, then the one right before it, just on being prepared for action in our minds of what we can do. But listen to 1 Peter chapter 1. So let's just, again, I want to rehearse it because I want you to talk about it. The first in getting involved in the things of our nation that are so dark is are you an ambassador of Jesus or a social justice warrior? Number two, do you use injustices, hurts, and frustrations that are seemingly against you, your culture, your race, your family, your personal being as an opportunity to rant and to let the anger out and then just kind of have, just deal with it, that's me, and you need to hear the truth? Or do you see it as an opportunity to take that hurt, angst, and frustration and to say, man, let me take all of this frustration and hurt that I see happening and let me see that as an opportunity to advance the gospel. Number three is in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. So turn there again, get it your Bible, because I want you to underline it and see it. Here it is. Therefore, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. As it is written, be holy because I am holy. Here's point three. 
when you get involved, and I hope you do somehow in your school, in your work, wherever it is, I hope you begin to become that ambassador that gets involved. I hope you become the person that says, this is an opportunity for me to preach the peace, love of Jesus Christ and his hope. But before you dive into the swamp of this thing we call earth, and before you get into the mud, the muck, and the mire of the hate, the racism, the anger, and the vile that's out there, listen again, therefore, with your minds ready. Uh, One version says, prepare your mind for action. You cannot enter into the social justice warrior game if your mind's not ready. Uh, Because you're going to get sucked into it, and before you know it, arguing, uh, bickering, fighting, uh, just look at what's going on on the the news. I mean, you'll see it pretty clear. People have entered into the equation of hurt, anger, and frustration to make a point and to prove a point, but because their mind was not ready, they reverted to ignorance, hurtful things, destroying property, Uh, You know, I mean, and so you look at it and go, what in God's name is going on? Well, what in God's name is going on is you're looking at people who, uh, you know, are not ambassadors representing Jesus. They're not seen as a cause for the gospel. It's a cause for my flesh, my anger, my frustration, uh, you know, to just vent. I mean, I'm going to vent. I'm going to let you know how I really feel because your mind has to be prepared. And this is a problem for Christians because we often don't do well debating with people who don't believe like us. Uh, Whether that's another race or another denomination or what, uh, because it it ends up being a verbal war. And and it's sad to me that we've lost how to debate. We've lost how to talk things out. We've lost the ability to sit down with someone who has a different perspective than me, who sees it differently. Uh, I would just encourage you. I imagine if you sit down with a Hispanic, if you're white and you sit down with a Hispanic or you sit down with a, uh, an African-American person or an Asian person or just anybody, whatever you know, nationality you are, if you just sit down with a different nationality, you are going to get a different perspective. Their, their culture, the way they see it, their, their upbringing, their life, their experiences. But if we're not careful, we don't ready our minds for action and, and we just, you know, kind of yang yang at each other. And, and then, you know, because we never prepared our mind. And so the way we act is we just act in ignorance from an unredeemed, ungenerated, unsaved self. Our, our verbal, uh, you know, the way we talk to each other, the coarse jokes that we make, uh, you know, the hurtful things that we say, the passive aggressive remarks that we make against each other, it just doesn't work. If you're gonna be an ambassador who takes the cause of Jesus to seize an opportunity to preach the gospel, you need to have your mind ready. You need to say, Holy Spirit, man, keep me at peace. Holy Spirit, keep me on the truth so I can be an ambassador for Jesus in my home, in my workplace. Let's turn to chapter 2 with Peter. Now, as you're in chapter 2, this is uh, our chapter for the whole week. So our groups are going to be meeting around this chapter. And uh, I encourage you to read it every single day. First Peter chapter 2, all week long. It's not that long. It's just 25 verses long. And our Bible reading videos are going to be built around this. But this is a beautiful chapter um, because I love what it's it's going to teach me at the end talking about Jesus, that it it tells me that he's my example. And so that's kind of what we're going to pull out all week long. And I think it's a very appropriate chapter that as we get into this and we see what Jesus did, that he left us an example to follow. And so that's kind of our, you know, our big idea for the week coming from this chapter is that, yes, there's a lot of hell going on. There's a lot of mischievousness, injustices, anger, resentment, bitterness, hatred. Just I would just encourage you to maybe kind of get off the news for a while and clean your mind out because it if you're not careful, all of that hatred builds up and we end up ceasing to be the ambassadors, seizing a gospel moment and we get sucked into an emotional plea, and and it becomes more about me, 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 rather than Jesus, 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 uh, which is what the world really needs, you pleading to take them to Jesus. So this chapter that talks about that Jesus is a fine example for us, I just want to run through a, a few thoughts now 
uh, what can you do practically as you get out and you begin to share Jesus, as you begin to own your 50 feet? Verse 1 of 1 Peter. So rid yourself of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, and like newborn babes, desire pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation. The first thing is uh, as you begin to own your 50 feet, and I love what it says, is you can't do it with malice. Uh, malice is evil intent. Malice is bad behavior. Malice is bad conduct. Malice is, is I have evil intentions against you. So as you get out there and you're at work and you're, you, know, you hear the chatter going on all around you, you're scrolling social media, you see the myriad of different videos that are shared, you need to watch your heart that you don't let malice become a seed because malice is, I begin to have evil intent. Uh, and, and that doesn't have to be actionable. That can just be an intention. It can be a thought. I start, I start not liking any, any police officer, not just the ones that did bad. I don't like any of them. They're all bad. I don't like any white people. I don't like any black people. I don't like any Hispanic people. They're all this. They're all that. That's malice. So anytime we as Christians begin to look at different races, different cultures, different nationalities of people, different jobs, and we lump everybody into the category of being evil, well, we've missed the gospel. We've missed what the gospel is, that there's hope for everybody, that there's, there's grace for everybody. And if we're not careful, we love Jesus, but we have malice in our heart. We love Jesus, but we're very skeptical. I love Jesus, but I'm, I'm critical about that group of people. I'm critical about them. I'm skeptical about them. I'm bitter about them, and that's malice. And it's very hard to be a Christian if you have malice. And here's why. Because you prejudge everybody. You don't even give people a chance to come to know Jesus. You don't even give people a chance to be born again, to, to hear the grace that you have, to receive the mercy that you receive, because malice prejudges people. And so I just would leave you, you know, now with, with number four, be the ambassador, see it as an opportunity to spread the gospel. Number three, prepare your mind. And number four, Man, you cannot be a, a strong Christian if you allow malice and hypocrisy in your life. You are representing Jesus. You need to represent him well. And what does Jesus do? Well, even to the worst of the worst of the worst people, Jesus always brought mercy and grace. Man, and I'm thankful it happened to me, and I hope you're thankful it happened to you. We'll pass that on. And don't just prejudge people who've not lived up to your standard or lived up to what you think's right. And really be honest with yourself. Do you have malice? Uh, you know, do you have evil intent toward another culture, a race of people, a group of people, a profession of people? Do your children, do you talk in a malicious way around the dinner table? Do you make crass jokes about other nationalities and races? Do you, are you a white family that makes crass jokes about blacks or blacks that make crass jokes about Hispanics or whatever? Uh, that's malice. It's, it's an intentional thing. It may not be done publicly, but it breeds in the heart. And that becomes the breath of racism. It becomes the breath of anger. It becomes the breath of resentment. And, and Paul says, look, man, you just got to rid yourself of that. So now we're talking about going out in the community. You can't go out with malice and evil intent. You have to go out with, man, there's hope for everybody. There's life for everybody. There's grace for everybody. And there's mercy for everybody. And dear God, don't let me prejudge who's worthy of that grace and mercy versus who's not worthy of that grace and mercy. That'll really help you. The second thing is this. It's down in verse 3. And this is what it states. It says, if you've tasted that the Lord is good. Uh, man, and I'll tell you, because this is a challenge for me, when, when I see all this happening and all the hell and hurt and vile and evil that goes on, sometimes it's hard just to think the goodness of God because we get caught up in the evil of people. And 
you know, and, and once you get sucked into the evil of people, and like I say, it's been going on forever. I mean, we're just happening to see it now in a generation because everybody has a cell phone, so we get the viral videos. But let, let's not trick ourselves that there hadn't been murder going on for centuries and evil and perversion going on for millennia. Uh, it just happens to be real to us now because everybody has a phone in their hand. So let's don't play the game that it's, it's new. It's not new. It's old. It's old from the father of the devil, who's a murderer from the beginning, John 8. But I love what this said, that we've tasted the goodness of God. And so this will be point five. If you're not careful, you will put all of your energy onto the badness of people rather than to the goodness of God. Because even in the midst of all the hell that's going on, God's a good God. And we may look out there and go, well, I don't feel like he's good because if he was good, he should stop this, 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 and this. And if God was so good, then why doesn't he stop that? And if God's so good, then why? If God's so good, then why? And the answer to then why is you. Because you are that ambassador of his goodness. So if you sit on your couch and go, well, if God's so good, then why? Uh, just hold up a mirror or take a selfie. That's why. Because you are the ambassador of his goodness. So don't get caught up in just whining about all the evil, wondering where God is. God is in you if you're born again. And you're to take that goodness to people. You've tasted how good he is. Take that out. I mean, come on. If you share my favorite Mexican restaurant is open, tweet, tweet, and you uh, Instagram your favorite meal or your favorite movie, and you talk about how good it is, or you've uh, you know, taken a nice picture of yourself out on the lake or the beach and how tan you are, well, if you can do that, then you also can share the goodness of God. And so I challenge you inside your 50 feet, don't get caught up in the frustration of the world is so dark and evil. Yeah, tell your children that. They need to know that. It is a dark world. It is an evil world. Uh, my daughter's going to high school this year. I'm sure she's going to bump into a lot of dark, evil things, comments in the hallway, uh, trash talking, uh, sexual comments. I mean, I've already dealt with it before with my other daughters. So, you know, I'm kind of aware that my daughter's going to be thrust into a public high school this year. But, you know, I'm not fearful of that. I'm not fearful that my daughter is going to go into the ninth grade and she's going to hear perverted talk from boys and uh, she's going to see things. Uh, in a way, I, I'm, I don't only expect it, I'm glad that she sees it because it reminds her that in the middle of the badness, honey, you have the goodness of God. And so I don't fear that. So I tell you the same thing. Don't fear the badness, just enhance the goodness. Raise your hand and go, yes, it is bad. I see it, I recognize it, uh, I admit it. But I want to hold up this hand and say there's still a good God. And I want to introduce you to that good God. That's the boldness we need. So I'll, I'll, again, I'll kind of take that thought with this. If you're going to whine about where is God in all of this, look in the mirror and say he's in you. Then turn the question to, then why am I not doing anything about it? And that ought to give you an answer to why God. Uh, why God, you need to answer what about me? And that kind of bridges your answer for you. I want to give you one final thing that I think will help you as you move forward. And then it's in verse 15. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. So in your 50 feet, you're going to bump into foolish people ignorant people, people who are saying hateful things, people who are tweeting hateful things. You may even follow people on your social media that just have vile things. They're angry, they're hurtful, whatever. Or you may hear comments of such, but I'll read it again, verse 15. It is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by good works. So what can you do? You can do good things. What can you do? You can pray for people. What can you do? You can bless somebody. Man, buy them a coffee. Talk to them. Uh, one of the things that I see that's good is just listen. Listen to people before you throw your comment back. You know, I, I think Robin would agree with this. Years ago, uh, you know, if you were talking to me or she were talking, I was already formulating what I'm going to say. Like, I'm not even listening to you. I'm thinking about what I'm going to come back with. Like, I'm going to have the comeback. I'm going to have my opinion here. And I've learned as I've grown up that the greatest thing I can do is shut my mouth and listen. 
because I can learn a lot by just listening to people and then say to that, well, God, man, what good can I do here? So that's how I want you to think today. Number one, are you an ambassador or just a social justice warrior representing yourself or representing Jesus? Number two, do you see every hurtful thing as an opportunity for you to rant and rage of your opinion or for you to advance the gospel forward? Number three, is your mind ready for action? Are, are, you, are you ready to step out and be bold with what God wants you to do? Not just emotional, but representing Jesus well, your mind prepared for action, self-controlled. Are you willing to let go of all evil intent, not to get sucked in to prejudging people, but giving everybody the grace of Jesus Christ, giving everybody an opportunity for mercy, giving every hateful event, every person you've prejudged an opportunity to know God? Are you willing to see goodness rather than badness, to focus on the goodness of God rather than the evil of people? You see, it's very easy to go out, tweet, 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 share, share, share how evil people are, but then you never step up and go, there's hope for evil people. It's the goodness of God, and God has you where he has you to be that goodness. And then are you willing to silence ignorant talk because you do good things? Man, give an extra tip, pray an extra prayer, be kind to someone. Uh, listen to someone, call a friend and say, would you come over and talk to me? I want to hear your perspective of what's going on. Get with people of other races and say, how are you dealing with it? How are you, how can we as Christians, because the beautiful thing, whether, you know, I don't know if we like this or not, but the greatest thing of all is above race, above culture, above our opinions, above all the things that we humans hold so dear to us. We are part of the family of God foremost. We belong to Jesus. As you read this chapter of this week, it's going to teach us that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and then this line, a people who belong to God. That is first and foremost your duty as a believer. You belong to God first. And so I pray that this opens a door for you to talk. I pray that it opens a door for you, mom and dad, to talk to your kids, especially about the word malice and how we can have evil intentions, or maybe how we can focus so much on the bad that we forget to really bring the goodness of God. Or maybe you're that social justice warrior. You're ranting and raving of your opinions, but you're forgetting that you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ first, and you're to represent His reconciliation, not just reconciling your emotions and your hurt, but you're reconciling His grace and love. Hey, I hope this blessed you today. I hope it challenges you to be a stronger Christian in your faith. We need you in the forefront. Uh, you hear this all the time, you know, talking about nurses and doc doctors. They're in the forefront of the battle for COVID. Well, guess what? We need you in the forefront of the battle for darkness and light. We need you to get off the couch and own your 50 feet. We need you to quit tweeting it and begin to represent it. We need you to just quit sharing a picture and you begin to share your faith. That's where we're going to make a difference when we all own our 50 feet. Look, I love you. I bless you. I'm going to ask you to get your communion together. We're just going to pray a prayer of reconciliation. I don't know who it is. It may have hurt you, disappointed you. I remember when the guy that killed my wife, I saw him out several months later on the college campus with two cases of beer in his hand, getting ready to go into a football game. And the anger and the hurt and the resentment and I heard the Lord just speak to me, Mark, you have to forgive him. Man, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to hear that word. I have to forgive somebody that hurt me. But that's reconciliation. So as we get ready to partake of communion this morning, I want to ask you, is there somebody you need to reconcile with? Is there a thought in your heart toward another race, another group of people, another profession, a hurtful event, a person that did you wrong, a bitterness, a seed of bitterness? Are you coarse joking with your children? Are you making uh, crass comments about people? Well, as we partake communion, let's say, God, give us reconciliation. I bless you. I hope you have a great week. I hope you stay in this scripture all week long and let it speak to you of how you can be the best example of Jesus Christ to our world. I love you. Father, in Jesus' name, I bless our communion now. God, I ask as we get ready to partake of this, we're first off very thankful that you have reconciled us to yourself by Jesus. And God, I'm also thankful that right now we let go of every person that has ever done us. Would you just pray that with me? Pray this prayer. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me mercy in Jesus. Thank you for the grace of a new life in Jesus. And now I choose, God, to forgive anyone that's ever wronged me. They don't owe me anything. I let them go and I bless them in Jesus' name. Reconcile them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's partake of communion. Believers, I love you. I hope to see you soon. Bless you.